Today's video is sponsored by Magellan TV, the best documentary streaming service on the planet. Number 3, Rhonda Smith. In January 2008, 6 year old Judy Zellner had been attending Trinity Evangelical Luther Church for two and a half decades. The church is in rural Springfield Township, Pennsylvania. She came twice a week to clean the church. When she arrived at the church on January 23, 2008, she was surprised to find the door to the office unlocked. In the office, she found 42-year-old Rhonda Smith in a pool of blood on the floor. Zellner immediately called 911. It was clear to the paramedics that Rhonda had been shot in the head. She was rushed to the hospital and was on life support. Rhonda had been a church member for a couple of years. She was a volunteer who worked in the office. Rhonda had bipolar disorder for about 20 years. She had been hospitalized twice because of her disorder. Her disorder made it difficult to hold down a job, but she felt very much at home at the church. People at the church also liked her. Shortly before she was shot, the pastor had taken up a collection from the other church members to help her pay her bills. On January 20th, 2008, three days before she was shot, she stood at the pulpit and thanked people for their donations. On the evening she was shot, her parents decided to donate her organs, but it turned out they couldn't do that. She needed all her organs for her autopsy to prove she died from the gunshot wound. Then they took her off life support and 42-year-old Rhonda Smith passed away. There was speculation that Rhonda had taken her own life. She had talked about taking her own life in the past. She had also broken up with her boyfriend about two weeks before her death. However, her parents didn't think she was suicidal. After the police investigated the death, it became clear that Rhonda did not take her own life. For example, she had been shot twice in the head. One grazed her forehead and the other was a kill shot. But most importantly, no gun was found on the church property. The police started by interviewing men that Rhonda had dated, but they were quickly cleared as suspects. The police soon had another suspect, 65-year-old Mary Jane Fonder. The church's pastor and many other church members thought she was an unusual woman. She often said inappropriate comments. She tended to ramble and talk about herself nonstop. She also did odd things like her entering the pastor's kitchen and leaving him food. She continued to do this even after the pastor told her to stop. Mary Jane would also call the pastor at home and leave long, rambling voicemails. Sometimes the voicemail system would cut her off after four minutes and she would call back and talk for another four minutes. It got to be so bad that the pastor blocked her number. She also thought that there was a romantic connection between her and the pastor. The pastor became so frustrated with Mary Jane that he suggested she find another church. But she didn't leave the church. She also started calling the church's office and leaving voicemails for the pastor. So the police began to look into Mary Jane Fonder's background. She was born in July 1942 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Her parents were Edward and Alice Fonder. Edward was a machinist and her mother was a proofreader at a publishing company. When Mary Jane was in high school, her mental illness first emerged. While in high school, she attempted suicide and was hospitalized for a month. In 1987, Mary Jane moved in with her parents so she could take care of them. In September 1992, her mother, Alice, died of natural causes. After that, the relationship between Mary Jane and her father, Edward, soured. On August 26, 1993, Mary Jane said she made her 80-year-old father breakfast and then went to lie down. She said she heard the front door open and close but didn't think anything about it. When she got up, her father was gone. This was strange because her father couldn't drive and had mobility issues, so he used a cane. She immediately called the police and reported him missing. Friends and family helped search for him but neither they nor the police could find any trace of 80-year-old Edward Fonder. The police began to suspect Mary Jane was responsible for his disappearance. Notably, her father had previously gone missing, but the family found him after 90 minutes. 
That time, Mary Jane didn't report him missing to the police. She said she didn't report him missing because they had found him. The lead investigator thought it was strange that this time, Mary Jane immediately reported him missing. Also, in the house, they found items that appeared to have been stored in the trunk of her car, like oil cans and windshield fluid. The investigator looked in the trunk of the car, and it was empty. Then, in the bathroom, the investigator saw some pinkish water in a bucket. Mary Jane said it was from the dog getting sick. However, the detective didn't investigate further. Mary Jane also refused to take a polygraph exam. But Mary Jane was never charged in connection with her father's disappearance. A year later, Edward's wallet with all its contents was found in a mailbox in Allentown, Pennsylvania, about 60 miles from his home in Springfield, Pennsylvania. That was the last trace of him that was ever found. Over 20 years later, Edward Fonder's remains have not been found. After looking into Mary Jane's background, the detectives at Rhonda Smith's murder decided she was worth investigating. They learned in 1994 she was fired from Denny's for threatening a co-worker. Because she was fired with cause, she wasn't entitled to unemployment pay. In December 1994, she had an unemployment hearing. On that same day, she bought a handgun. At the hearing, she was denied compensation. She snapped and told off the members of the unemployment board. The detectives decided to interview Mary Jane. Without prompting, she said she spoke with Rhonda on the morning of the murder. Mary Jane said she had called the church office and was surprised when Rhonda answered the phone. Mary Jane was asked what she did on the morning of the murder. She said she went to her hairdressers and then went to Joanne Fabrics. She said she left her home at 10.55 a.m. The police thought that Rhonda was killed around 10.55 a.m because, according to the computer technician, that is when she stopped using the computer. The police thought it was odd that Mary Jane said she left her house at the same time Rhonda was killed. Then they asked her about the gun. Mary Jane said she threw it into a nearby lake in 1994. After the interview, the police were much more suspicious of Mary Jane. They learned she had signed in at her hairdresser's at 11.22 a.m. Based on the location of her home, the police knew that she had enough time to shoot Rhonda Smith and then make it to the hairdressers. The police continued to interview Mary Jane. She was a very chatty woman who tended to ramble. From their interviews, they determined that Mary Jane was jealous of Rhonda Smith for several reasons. Mary Jane admitted she had romantic feelings for the pastor, but she thought that the pastor was attracted to Rhonda. Also, Mary Jane had suffered financial difficulties, but had never received any money from the church members. Finally, the women at the church had taken a liking to Rhonda and included her in social gatherings. Mary Jane, who had been going to the church for decades, was not accepted by the women and was rarely invited to social gatherings. So now the police had a motive. Mary Jane was jealous of Rhonda, but they still had no evidence that the 65-year-old church-going woman murdered Rhonda Smith. On March 29, 2008, nearly two months after the murder, a man and his son were fishing on the same lake Mary Jane said she had thrown her gun into 14 years earlier. They found a Rossi 38 caliber handgun. Ballistic testing determined it was the gun that was used to shoot Rhonda Smith. The gun was also registered to Mary Jane Fonder. With the discovery of the gun, the police arrested Mary Jane. They also searched her house and found her day planner. On the day of the murder, Mary Jane had written, Rhonda murdered just before her hair appointment. Mary Jane Fonder went to trial in October 2008. Her lawyer claimed that someone had retrieved the gun from the lake and used it to kill Rhonda and then threw it back into the lake. The prosecution said that explanation made no sense. The trial lasted two weeks. Then the jury deliberated for six hours. They found 66-year-old Mary Jane Fonder guilty of first-degree murder. She was sentenced to life in prison. Mary Jane Fonder died in prison in June 2018 at the age of 75. Number 2. The St. Patrick Church Shooting Alaska is a city in La Crosse County, Wisconsin. In 1985, it was home to about 10,000 people. 
64-year-old John Roster was the pastor at St. Patrick's Catholic Church in the town. He was much beloved in the town. On the morning of February 7, 1985, Roster was going to preside over a mass for the children of the school next door. Two sixth grade girls were set to read scripture passages. This upset one of the prisoners, 29-year-old Brian Stanley. Up until the late 1970s, females were not allowed to read scripture during masses, but then the Pope allowed it. Rossiter told Stanley that since the Pope approved it, he didn't see a problem with it. Stanley then stormed off and sat in one of the pews. The mass went well. After it finished, all the children and the parishioners left the church. Rossiter was kneeling in front of the altar, giving one last prayer of thanksgiving. Then he was shot in the back of the head with a 12-gauge shotgun by 29-year-old Brian Stanley. The 64-year-old was killed instantly. Stanley then went to the sacristy, a room in a Catholic church where vestments and sacred objects are stored. In the sacristy was laymaster, 55-year-old Ferdinand Roth. He was putting on his coat to leave. Stanley shot him to death. Another laymaster saw the shooting. He ran into the kitchen in the basement where his wife was working as a cook. She was cooking with another woman. The laymaster told them about the shooting. The laymaster and his wife ran from the church and called the police. The other woman hid in a closet. Meanwhile, Stanley went into the basement. He found the church custodian, 66-year-old William Hames, and shot him to death. Stanley then left the church. The police found him a few blocks from the church and arrested him. He identified himself as Elijah. He said he was a prophet who fought against false gods. Recently, the area's bishop had received an odd letter from someone identifying themselves as Elijah. The letter's author wrote they had been called by God to go to Israel to bomb one of the holy temples. The triple murder shocked the small town. Brian Stanley went to trial in October 1985. Stanley pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Five of his family members testified that when Stanley came home from the army in February 1983, two years before the shooting, he had mental health problems. A family member took him to the church and he said he felt safe from the devil inside the church. His family members testified about how difficult it was trying to help Stanley with very little knowledge about mental illness. He had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. By the time of the murders, he was off his medication and was delusional. Three psychiatrists all testified that Stanley didn't understand the wrongfulness of his actions, nor could he conform his behavior to the law. The judge ultimately ruled that he was insane and therefore not legally responsible for the murders. He was sent to a state psychiatric hospital. After the murders, Stanley's mother fought to change the laws so that a mentally ill person could be involuntarily committed to a hospital before they hurt someone. In April 1996, 11 years after the murders, largely thanks to her work, the laws of Wisconsin were changed. It's believed at this time, Brian Stanley is still in a state psychiatric hospital. Number 1. Angelica Klug In the autumn of 2006, 23-year-old Angelica Kluke was on a working holiday in Glasgow, Scotland. Kluke was Polish and she was taking Scandinavian studies at the University of Gdansk. In Glasgow, she was staying in the clergy house at St. Patrick's Catholic Church. She was living rent-free in exchange for cleaning the church. On September 24, 2006, she went missing. Her sister, who lived in Glasgow, reported her missing. And five days later, a horrifying discovery was made in the church. The following clip is from the documentary series, Our Toughest Cases, which is available on Magellan TV, who is today's sponsor. On the Saturday morning, 30th of September, about 8 o'clock in the morning, I received a phone call to say that the body of a young woman had been found beneath the church. Under the carpet, there was a small hatch, and under the floor, a body of a young woman was found, bound, gagged, stabbed, and beaten. 
We did not know who that was. On the 30th of September 2006, Scottish police discovered the body of an unidentified woman beneath the floorboards of St Patrick's Church in Glasgow. Sadly, I have to inform you that Mr Nugan treated his murder. All I can say it was it was a horrific and very very violent uh, attack on a young uh, young lady. I was in my office at the headquarters of the Archdiocese of Glasgow, which is only five minutes' drive from here on the riverfront. Stunned disbelief. How could that have happened? Surely not. These were the kind of voices that, that were raised at the time. Nothing like this had ever happened. I had to take advice from experts as regards how to proceed with that crime scene experts. Carol was significant, the most important person in that scene. My initial thought was, this looks like a sexually motivated murder. For a sexually motivated murder, it's imperative that you examine the body where it is without moving the body because you're dealing with body fluids. It was apparent she was bleeding and potentially there's going to be semen present. Always in my mind, you know, at that time, Am I doing the right thing here, making this decision? If we didn't examine her in situ, we were running a massive risk that we could destroy vital evidence. So I had to deal with that. Every time you go out to a crime scene and there's someone dead, even though you're going out as a professional and a scientist, you're still very aware that this is someone's family and a loved one. We have a young woman there we don't know it's Angelica Kluck. We have her boyfriend who wants to know, is this my dear Angelica? The sister wants to know, the media want to know. How do you deal with that? That was a big, big challenge because the questions that were being asked by people were, okay then, if it's not Angelica, are you still searching for Angelica? Of course we are, is the, is the answer, because we don't know who that is. If you want to see our toughest cases and other great documentaries on Magellan TV, they have a great deal for our viewers. They are offering our viewers 30 days of free service. To get this amazing deal, go to try.magellantv.com slash criminally listed. So as the detective was saying in the clip, they found a woman's dead body under the church's floorboards. It was determined to be the body of 23-year-old Angelica Klug. Her death had been brutal. She had been raped, beaten with the leg of a table, and stabbed 16 times in the body and the head. Despite all this, it's suspected that she was still alive when she was put under the floorboards of the church. It wasn't long before the police developed a suspect. She was last seen in the company of the church's handyman, Patrick McLaughlin. She had gone with him to paint a garage on the church's property. In the garage, the police found blood splatter. McLaughlin had been questioned earlier in the week, but when the police went to talk to him again, he was gone and he was nowhere to be found. Then the police got a phone call. They said that Patrick McLaughlin was really Peter Tobin and he was a registered sex offender. In August 1993, Tobin was living in Hampshire, England. Two 14-year-old girls went to visit a friend, but they weren't at home. Tobin lived in the flat next door. The girls asked if they could stay there and wait for their friend. Tobin let them into his apartment. At the time, he was watching his young son. He then held the girls at knife point. He forced them to drink alcohol and take drugs. He raped one and sexually assaulted the other. He also stabbed one of them. He turned the gas on on his stove, but he didn't light it. He then left the girls tied up in the apartment to be poisoned by the gas. But they managed to escape. The assault was reported to the police. Tobin had gone into hiding at that point. He joined a religious sect and told them that his name was Peter Wilson. He remained with the group for nearly a year. Then his crimes were profiled 
on the popular television show Crime Watch. His photo was shown during the segment. A fellow member of the sex saw the show and reported him. Tobin was arrested in May 1994. He pleaded guilty to the assault on the two girls and he was sentenced to 14 years of prison. In May 2004, after serving about 10 years of prison, he was released. He then moved to Paisley, a town just outside of Glasgow, Scotland. He then got a job as a handyman using a false name at St. Patrick's Church. After the murder of Angelica Kluke, there were broadcasts all over the United Kingdom to be on the lookout for Tobin. A week after the murder, Tobin went to a hospital in London, England, complaining of chest pains. He gave the name James Kelly. However, a nurse recognized him from a police alert and they called the police. He was arrested and charged with Angelica's murder. Six-year-old Peter Tobin went to trial in April 2007. The prosecution had a strong case against him. His fingerprint was found on the tape used to cover Angelica's mouth. His fingerprints were also found on the tarp that was wrapped around her body. His semen was also found in Angelica's underwear. Also, when he was arrested, he was wearing a t-shirt with a stain on it. The stain was a mixture of his semen and cellular DNA from Angelica. The trial lasted six weeks. The jury found Tobin guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison. The police didn't believe that Angelica was his first murder victim, so after they arrested him, they began to look at his history. The investigation was called Operation Anagram. They found out that he moved often and worked in various jobs. He had used at least 20 different aliases. They thought he might have murdered 15-year-old Vicki Hamilton. In February 1991, Tobin was living in Bathgate, Scotland. On February 10, 1991, Vicky was at a bus stop in Bathgate. She was waiting for a bus to go back home to Reading. Then, she disappeared. Tobin lived less than a mile from the bus stop. In June 2007, the police searched the property he lived in at the time and found a bloody knife. It had Vicky's DNA on it. The police confronted Tobin. He claimed he knew nothing about Vicky Hamilton and her disappearance. The police searched the property and found no other traces of Vicky. Then, in November 2007, they searched the property where he had moved a few weeks after Vicky disappeared. Buried on the property, they found the remains of Vicki Hamilton. She had been raped and strangled to death. After killing her, he cut her body in half at the waist. He then wrapped her body parts in plastic. The police believe he kept her body in his home in Bathgate and then took the remains with him when he moved. The police were surprised when they found yet another set of remains on the property. She was identified as 18-year-old Dinah McNichol. On August 4, 1991, Dinah attended a music festival in Lipoke, Hampshire. She was hitchhiking home when she disappeared. She had been bound with her own clothing. She was then strangled to death. The police found Tobin's DNA on both victims. Pierre Tobin went to trial for the murder of Vicki Hamilton in November 2008. He was found guilty and once again he was sentenced to life in prison. He went to trial a year later for the murder of Dinah McNichol. The jury deliberated for 15 minutes before finding him guilty. Once again, he was sentenced to life in prison. Many investigators do not believe that these were the only murders Tobin committed. Sometime between May 15th and May 18th, 1980, 22-year-old Jessie Earl went missing from Eastbourne, a seaside town in England. Her nude body was found nine years later at Beachy Head. None of her clothes, except for her bra, were found. Her bra was knotted and found close to her body. Despite the odd nature of the remains, the police initially did not think it was a homicide. But after Tobin was arrested for Angelica Kluke's murder, they reopened the case. Tobin had lived in the area at the time, but he suddenly moved away after she went missing. Jessie also told people she was nervous about a Scottish man whom she had met at Beachy Head. It is also believed that Tobin is responsible for the disappearance of 18-year-old Louise Kay. She was last seen in the early morning hours of June 23, 1988, after a night out with friends. She dropped off a friend at Eastbourne 
and then she was going to sleep in her car at Beachy Head. After that, neither she nor her car were ever seen again. At the time of her disappearance, Tobin worked at a bar in Eastbourne. Their other murders were Tobin as the suspect, but the links are more tenuous. He was also a suspect in the Bible John serial murders. It's believed that one man murdered three women in 1968 and 1969 in Glasgow, Scotland. But the police ultimately ruled him out as a suspect in that case. Pierre Tobin did not have an easy time in prison. In January 2019, 33-year-old Sean Monaghan, who was serving six years after being convicted of two rapes, attacked him with a shank. He slashed him on the right side of the face and his throat. Seven-year-old Tobin survived, but he was left with a seven-inch scar. Moynihan had 40 months added on to his sentence. Pierre Tobin died at age 76 from cancer in October 2022. If he killed more than the three women that he was convicted of killing, he took that secret with him to the grave. However, before he died, he told psychiatrists that his true victim count was 48, so in the future, more murders may be connected to him. Thank you for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our sponsor, Magellan TV. Go to try.magellantv.com slash criminally listed for 30 days of free service. But well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.